Listen. We'll see how it comes out. The air conditioning begins. Quiet, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to speak to you today. And I should like to thank Hans Bopper for being invited to this very beautiful place. Uh, perhaps first I should tell you who I am, and it's what I'm going to say depends a great deal upon my personal experience. Uh, for many years I worked as a doctor in a hospital, a general hospital in a British slum and in the prison next door. And the main differences between these two great institutions was that there was violence, uh, violence in the prison than in the hospital. And a great deal more laughter. Seems that people prefer to be in uh, prison than in hospital, at least some people. And this isn't uh, itself without significance. Well, I've retired uh, now, uh, but I still do a, a little bit of legal work, and, uh, which is writing uh, reports uh, for the courts. Uh, recently, I was asked to write a prepare a report on an 18 year old girl who was living with her 89-year-old great-grandmother, whom, in the traditional fashion, she had attacked. Uh, the young woman was, as usual for her, under the influence both of alcohol and cannabis, and she pushed her great-grandmother over, uh, breaking her collarbone. Uh, she was uh, living with the great-grandmother uh, because of the breakdown of her relationship with her mother. Of course, there was no father anywhere in sight. And uh, with her grandparents, she had to go to her great grandmother. But in the course of my examination of her, my interview with her, I asked her whether her mother had ever been in trouble with the police. Uh, yes, she said, and I, what for? I asked her. Uh, she was on the social, she said, uh, on the social in England means. Uh, on social security payments, which should really be called out as social. <laughs> she was on the social and she was working as well. Uh, what happened to us? Well, she said she had to give up work. <laughs> <laughs> this was said in a completely matter of fact way, as if it was self evident that it my. Uh, question had been a rather foolish one. Um, and a small incident like this, in my view, is very revealing. Uh, it tells you something about the worldview of the person concerned, uh, precisely because it is unself conscious and unguarded. It tells you that this young woman regards it as perfectly normal that the state should be the primary source of a person's income. Uh, if you like, being supported of the first or first resort rather than of last resort. Uh, in the social milieu in which this young woman grew up, it is now regarded as uh, uh, perfectly normal for people to spend their entire lives at the expense of the state, which is, of course, to say the taxpayers, uh, though the state is now so important in everyone's life. That it is seen as something that is just there, like a natural and inescapable feature of the landscape, such as a volcano, uh, more like a volcano than an artifact created and sustained by men. For many of those who live on the state, dependence is actually regarded as the opposite, that is to say, as independence. I worked in a hospital in which, if it had not been for the presence of immigrants, from the Indian uh, subcontinent or their descendants, uh, the illegitimacy rate amongst the children born there would have been 100%. Uh, to ask the identity of the young person's father had become indelicate or awkward. And many such people would either reply that they had no father, <laughs> in which case I would suggest that then they went up to medical administration straight away <laughs> to be photographed. <clears throat> or by saying such things as, Do you mind me and my father at the moment? <laughs> which is to say, the adult male member of the household uh, at the moment who is invariably in bird passage. 
<laughs> now that I hear recently somebody said, uh, do you mean my, uh, my daddy Nick or my uh, daddy John? <laughs> uh, contact with biological fathers uh, was lost, and more often than not. And when asked why they were no longer in contact with the fathers of their children, the mothers would say it was because they wanted their independence. <laughs> By this, they meant a complete lack of contact with the people who, one might have supposed, would most normally be intimately connected with them, such as their own parents and the father of their child, or more often, the fathers of their children. It's half siblings. And it was very difficult to tell the generations apart anymore as well. You couldn't assume that if there was an old woman or an oldish woman in her forties and a youngish woman with a baby, that the baby belonged to the young woman. So independence meant for these women a lack of social ties or any obligations to the people around them, not independence from the authorities or the state. On which, of course, they were utterly dependent for their food, their clothes, their lodging, their lighting, their heating, their healthcare, education, transport, indeed, absolutely everything that they consumed. And they regarded this as a perfectly normal uh, state of affairs. Well, let me now uh, move on briefly to a remarkable achievement of the British welfare state its production of more infidels than the First World War. <laughs> Let me uh, tell you a little story uh, from the ward in the hospital in which I worked, which will illustrate this point. A young and exceptionally fit, indeed athletic man, uh, was admitted having taken a deliberate uh, overdose. We in Britain take more sort of overdoses than any other nation in the world, uh, for reasons which actually have been good to Britain perfectly often. <laughs> I asked him uh, what he did uh, for a living, and he told me that he was on sick and did not work. And I asked him what sickness he had. A bad back, he replied. Now, that he answered in this fashion was in itself remarkable. Uh, most people who are on the sick who are asked this question reply that they get a sick certificate from their doctor. The sick certificate itself being regarded as the illness. Further inquiry into the nature of which is entirely superfluous and meaningless. So you never get out of, they say, uh, what are you uh, what are you on the sick for? And, uh, and they say, uh, I get a sick note. And they say, well, why do you get a sick note? Because I'm on the sick. <laughs> <laughs> and you never emerge from this, uh, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed that this particular young man was uh, perfectly able to get on and off the bed without any sign of pain or disability. A little later in the interview, I always uh, staggered, the, uh, staggered the question so that people didn't realise what I was asking. Um, so that I, I, they would don't understand the connection. Um, and incidentally, this man had not worked for 18 months. I asked him what his interests and hobbies were. Uh, martial arts. <laughs> this is uh, really the first time I've this is another new uh, medical illness. By uh, him, uh, a back injury that does not commit work, but does commit the practice of martial arts. And he also told me that he went for a job every night to get bad back. <laughs> now, I telephoned his family doctor, his general practitioner, to tell him that in my opinion, his patient being a sportsman who had no physical science and disability, seemed to me to be capable of not work. And the uh, family doctor replied, oh, I know all that, he said, uh, but the last time I tried to take a sick certificate away from a patient, he picked up the computer and threw it out. <laughs> so, now, <laughs> so now I just can sick to it, once one. Now, contrary to what you might suppose, this is not just an abuse of anecdote. It is actually emblematic of a mass phenomenon. 50% uh, of British doctors have been assaulted or threatened with assault in the last 12 months. And this creates precisely the atmosphere 
in, in which false certification uh, flourishes. Patients have come to expect a six certificate, not as a reflection of a genuine illness that they might have, but as an inalienable human right uh, declaration of independence. So, uh, no, it's true, these are both, et cetera. And also as a social service to help them out of their current difficulties or to accord with their wishes. Well, approximately two and a half million uh, adults in Britain are now in receipt of six certificates. The great majority of them, fortunately, were at least untruth. And those in receipt of them are pleased because they no longer have to pretend to look for work as they would if they were unemployed and, uh, and in receive unemployment benefit. And furthermore, uh, sickness benefit is 60% more than unemployment benefit in Britain. So the government is content with this situation because it can claim, and frequently does claim, and it has had its claims accepted when it reads in the French newspapers, for example, uh, an acceptance of this claim, that it has reduced the number of unemployed. Then, in fact, if you add the numbers of supposedly six to the numbers of unemployed in Britain, the total has not changed very much in the last 20 years. What has changed is the proportion of sick to unemployed where once there were far more unemployed than sick, there are now far more sick than unemployed. More than a million people are now more or less permanently <coughs> unemployed because of depression and anxiety alone. Well, the mass phenomenon I have described, in my view, is deeply corrupting. First, it corrupts political debate by allowing the government to assert things that, if not outright lies, are certainly not true. Uh, the opposition is reluctant to call these untruths by their name uh, because they know that they are likely to resort to the same, precisely the same untruths and distortions of the truth uh, themselves uh, when they come to power. The medical profession, which ought to be an incorruptible pillar of society, is corrupted because much of most doctors, most general practitioners, now issue official documents which have practical effect, knowing them to be false. And once you start behaving in this fashion, it reduces your capacity to resist further demands for intellectual, moral, and even financial uh, corruption. Finally, the effects on the recipients of these false uh, sickness uh, notes is a harmful as well. If people are certificated sick for long periods, in the end, they will begin to feel uh, sick and to play sick. And uh, this is perfectly natural. They come to inhabit a twilight world in which truth and lies, uh, the, the line between good and evil as well, it, it, it sort of mixes them, becomes indistinguishable or so intermixed that nothing is straightforward anymore, and everything then becomes just again. In short, integrity of any sort becomes impossible for the government, for the opposition, for the medical profession, and a significant part of the population, all of whom come to regard as dissimulation and lying and equivocation as perfectly normal and acceptable strategies in life, indeed as strategies for survival. <laughs> The twilight world of lies, untruths, and equivocations extends well beyond this particular situation. In there, in the welfare state, there is an incentive for people to present themselves as victims of circumstances, even or perhaps I should say, especially where they have created those circumstances themselves. This is reflected in the language they uh, lead, uh, they use, and the way. Uh, in which they talk about their lives. It's very noticeable in the language of criminals, for example. If a man stabs another person to death, he always says, the knife went in. It is the knife uh, that is the active uh, participant in the whole affair. Never mind that he actually took the knife across the city and killed the only person who he hates it. It was still the knife that is the, uh, the active participant. And I will illustrate what I mean also by reference to drug addiction. Uh, I use this um, uh, example, I've just written a book about 
possible. Addiction to heroin has become a mass phenomenon in Britain in the last 20 years or so. In the 1950s, when addicts were registered uh, by the Home Office of the Ministry of the Interior, there were known to be about 60 in her country. And while this might be an underestimate, it's unlikely to be wrong by very much. Well, it's now thought that there are about 300,000 heroin addicts in Britain. The entire apparatus of care of such people regards them as being in control of a, uh, in the grip of an uncontrollable impulse. They did not choose to take heroin in the first place. Their craving for it is so overwhelming that they cannot be expected to resist it. And the consequences of stopping heroin without medical attention are so terrible that no one would be expected to do so. Because such people need them to take heroin, and heroin costs money while at the same time destroying their capacity to work, and it's are driven to crime. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the official, I call it an ideology, an official ideology on which uh, treatment is based, and kind of policy based. Needless to say, all of this is completely and indeed obviously wrong. When an addict says he is hooked by heroin, as he invariably does say to explain his addiction hook, uh, like a fish, he attributes agency to the drug rather than to himself. But the evidence is that most addicts take heroin intermittently for a year before they take it regularly. And furthermore, they live in subcultures in which the consequences of taking the drug are, are extremely well known, unlike, for example, the dates of the Second World War or, or any other uh, actual um, historical fact, or indeed any other fact in You cannot overestimate the, uh, the effect of the British education system. I used to ask my young patients some uh, uh, questions to find out what they knew. I remember one of the most known for example was when I asked a chap uh, about 18, what three times four was. He said, after 11 years of uh, compulsory education, I should say attendance at school, he said, uh, <clears throat> We didn't get that far. <laughs> <laughs> Make me extremely proud of it. That's fair. <laughs> Anyhow. It would be more true to say that the addict took heroin than the heroin uh, uh, hooked the addict. And one has to choose to be an addict and to work at it. In fact. And the state of addiction is not come easily. It is not true that withdrawal from heroin is a serious medical condition. On the contrary, unlike the withdrawal from alcohol, which is a potentially serious condition, it is a trivial one. Insofar as the suffering from the poor from heroin is real rather than feigned, it is largely the result of anticipatory anxiety, which itself is the consequence of a mythology built up over many years and very insidiously promoted uh, by uh, doctors, social workers, courts, and so forth. The relation between addiction and crime is not as described. It is not true that addiction to heroin is incompatible with going to work. In the 1930s, for example, most American morphine addicts went to work just like other people. And in fact, in fact have quite often very busy days one way or another. They, they do actually say, well, I went out to work, but unfortunately their work is burning. <laughs> and therefore their inability to go to work is not a pharmacological consequence of the drug that they are taking. Addicts who are criminal usually have long criminal records before they ever take heroin. In other words, it is more likely that whatever causes them to become criminal also causes them to become addicts, rather than that their addiction causes them to become criminals. It is not true that medical assistance to stop taking their, that they need medical assistance to stop taking their drugs. Thousands, indeed millions of addicts, have done so without the slightest medical uh, assistance. Uh, 
then it's good to start learning. So that perhaps the most startling example is that of Mount St. Tully, who was by far uh, the greatest struggle terrorist in the history of the world. He said to Adams, if you don't stop, I will shoot you. <laughs> and when now offered to shoot you, you believe that he meant it. <laughs> and 20 million people learned their own gave up. Now, this would not, this means that there is, a, in my view, a conceptual difference between rheumatoid arthritis, shall we say, and drug addiction. It would not have made sense for now to say, stop having rheumatoid arthritis or I'll shoot you. <clears throat> but it didn't make sense. I'm not advocating for this policy, but it did make sense. It was a logical thing to say. In short, everything that is common knowledge about heroin addiction is wrong. Why is this common knowledge so deeply entrenched in public consciousness then? Uh, my answer is that there has been a dialectical relationship between the addicts and the apparatus of care for addicts. They need each other, um, and I wish I had a thousand euros for every addict who had said to me, I would give up if only I had the help. Help which was serious enough is never forthcoming in sufficient quantities or in uh, precisely the right way. If anything, I would say that the addiction services need the addicts more than the addicts need the services for addicts. For addicts. Um, both, however, have a basic interest in presenting addiction as something that just happens to people, as if a person became an addict in the same way that he might contract cancer. In other words, the bureaucracy of care requires a passive population. The passive population knows perfectly well, at some level of its heart and mind, that it is telling lies to itself and to others to obtain supposed benefits that a bureaucracy has to offer, and that it is therefore playing games. For example, uh, the very startling example of this is in prison, which I worked, I would observe prisoners who had just been brought to the prison. Supposed addicts in the waiting room immediately before they came into my consultation room. They would be laughing and joking among themselves, but when they entered my room, they would present themselves as being in the throes of agonizing before they would double up with pain and they would scream. In order that I would prescribe medication uh, for them, which they wanted, but in my view, did not need. When I pointed out that moments before they had been laughing and joking, and some of them would laugh and admit that, okay, this time they've been caught out. <laughs> but others would react with outrage and injured innocence. And, and it made me wonder really whether it is, uh, it is more, uh, uh, more difficult to be rightly accused or wrongly accused, which is worse than I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Anyhow, although it has been proved experimentally that addicts talk about drugs and addiction to each other in a very different way from how they talk to those who they think might offer them something usually drugs for, no notice is taken of this evidence by those who provide services for addicts. Uh, and they provide those services on the assumption that addicts are helpless playthings of something which is completely beyond their control. And this leads to absurdities that are almost beyond satire. For example, it is now official policy in Britain to give money or goods to addicts in return for their abstinence uh, from drugs, or at least uh, for the provision of urine samples that contain no drugs, which is actually quite another matter, as every like, experience of them knows. And this is the first time in history, in the history of medicine, as far as I know, that bribery has ever been considered a medical treatment in itself. <laughs> I once suggested satirically that we gave money to burglars as a treatment the terrible uh, disease of burglary. <laughs> and one will be able to demonstrate a proper uh, dose response curve. In other words, the more money you gave, the longer they would give out their burglary. 
Though there hasn't any uh, medical treatment, there would be failures. Uh, because there are burglars who do actually enjoy the burglary in itself. It's a vocation among men. Well, lo and behold, such uh, bribery uh, became official government policy not with regard to burglars, but with regard to bribers. Proving the victim of my late uh, friend, the economist uh, Peter Bauer, that uh, the only true unemployment these days is among satirists. In the world that uh, we have created, uh, satire is prophecy. <laughs> I've uh, spoken at length about drug addiction because it's a good example, I think one might call it in the matter, of the intellectual corruption that has become so prevalent in our countries, or at least, I don't know from experience in the British Royal State, both those who receive benefits and those who go now, instead of being 15% of British uh, households are now in receipt of direct receipt of uh, money from, from the government, are dependent on lies, dishonesty, half truths, contradiction, self deception, uh, play acting, and so forth, all of which, in my opinion, uh, destroy the human personality. And this is a bad thing, irrespective of the economic effects of uh, such uh, policies. Thank you very much.